Father, thank you. I know very well that I'm the, the Holy Spirit's the teacher and I'm the teacher's aide. I pray that the things I say might be helpful to everybody in this room. Anything that I might say that wouldn't be helpful, just stop me. The Bible says even before words are on my mouth, you know them, so just tell me what I am to say. And therefore, I will give you the praise and the thanks. And Lord, I pray that as I speak, uh, the people all over the room will be helped, healed, and brought closer to you. And I thank you, Father, for doing that. For it is your anointing that teaches us. We pray for uh, Bishop Beard, wherever he may be, to bring added healing to his eyes and strength to his body. And we, uh, we bless him right now in the wonderful name of Jesus. We pray for <clears throat> what's going on in Washington, D.C. We ask that your will be done as it is in heaven there. We pray right now for our president, the office of presidency. Somehow, Lord, restore and uh, raise up what needs to be there. Deliver us from criticalness and from uh, pessimism and sarcasm. And give us faith to believe that if you can raise the dead, there's not anything you can't do. So we pray for that right now, Father. Lord, we think about all the people in the world that are in Syria and other places that are being bombed and suffering and children that are being hurt. And we feel so privileged to be in such safety and such uh, <clears throat> luxury. Always keep us mindful of those who suffer so much while we uh, do not keep us humbled by that. And we, we praise you right now, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I know you're there. The light's in my eyes, so I can't see anybody. So every once in a while, somebody may cough or laugh or something. Just let me know you're there. Uh, I'm Terry Takel. I... I live in Houston, Texas. Uh, my wife and I just celebrated 53 years of marriage. Uh, I, I can't believe she's put up with me that long. Uh, I work uh, at a church called Faith Bridge. I'm their prayer pastor. It's a rather large Methodist church there in Houston. I'm also the chaplain for one of the largest Christian radio stations in, in uh, the area of Houston. And... Uh, then I do this on the weekends. So I guess I'm not too retired yet. <laughs> uh, I want to read a passage of scripture. Uh, Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And then Matthew 21.12, Jesus entered the temple courts, drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. He said, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Then the blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. Uh, one of my privileges, I've traveled all over the world and all over uh, the United States, is that I've seen the church from about 35,000 feet high. <laughs> I get a big picture of the church because I'm in so many different churches across the country. And just a number of years ago, I became very, more concerned about the church and the trend that it was taking uh, toward be becoming consumer-based rather than presence-based. Uh, so I wrote this book, if you can put it on the screen, called The Presence-Based Church. And... Uh, as you can see, it's a picture of the Ark of the Covenant where the angels are covering their faces as they look into the presence of God. And the idea behind this was to contrast what I call the consumer-based church and the church that seeks his presence and seeks more of him. Uh, 
By the way, I, I wrote several books. One was called Pray the Price, United Methodist, United in Prayer. This is a historical book because it's the only book that's got United Methodist and Pray on the cover. So I would just buy it for that reason. And if I signed it, it would get you a cup of coffee downtown at the cafe. Uh, I talked a while ago to the clergy about praying for your pastor and uh, realized that pastors are either prayed on or prayed for. Subtitle is the more people in your church praying for the pastor, the fewer are left to join the firing squad. Uh, and the goal of that was to uh, not wait for a crisis. Don't, don't just park an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, but build a guardrail at the curb. Uh, pray proactively for your pastor to be blessed and to be protected. And I led the clergy, some of you were there for a challenge to pray for Bishop Beard uh, to lift his hands as Aaron and her lifted Bishop Moses' hands. Here's a room, a book for making room to pray. Uh, it's a, I mean, building a prayer room in your church, a place where people can come on a sign-up basis and uh, pray about information in the prayer room. Uh, we started this about 20 years ago, and it's just been amazing to me as I travel across the country, all the prayer rooms that have been built, uh, and people come during the week. And uh, I always think that the victories on Sunday are won Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Monday in the prayer room by people praying. Uh, Sometimes in the intercessory handbook, this is a book that kind of like the prayer etiquette, etiquette book about uh, confidentiality and things you need to maintain in a, in a prayer ministry, like having a prayer room. Uh, this is a book, I'll talk about this tomorrow morning, I think, at the morning manna, about teaching people to pray scripture. And to this is praying through the book of Acts. And of course, it's called Acts 29 is because Acts is the only book in the Bible that's not finished yet. If you'll notice, the last chapter, 28, has no conclusion because we're writing chapter 29 in Peoria or Champaign or Springfield or wherever you are. You're actually chapter 29. <laughs> and uh, we sell a lot of these books to the Episcopalians. I don't know why they like it so much. <laughs> I just It's a weird thing, but they buy them by the bunches of them. Uh, here's a book if you want to learn how to pray personally and you don't feel worthy how to pray after you've kicked the dog I, you know I don't know where that title came from but it just if you kicked the dog and felt bad about it how would you talk to God later so this book is about helping people who feel unworthy to pray it comes with a study guide uh, and then this is a book about outside the camp it's sort of a companion book to the other book the presence-based church it's uh going outside your camp which represents your familiarities of life your rhythms of life to seek God when you don't have a tumor to seek God when you don't have a crisis but to go after God because he's worthy of it um, and then um, these are small little prayer chains with keys uh keys Change with prayers for husband and wife. How many husbands are here today? If you would buy those for your wife and pray for her every day, you'd be surprised how, how it would change. She'd let you be gone longer, spend more money, and you'd, she'd make you better coffee. But anyway, uh, there's also a key for the, the lost. Uh, but those who I'm in Christ are really good for teaching people your identity and your value in Christ. Uh, and unfortunately, we sell more for the husband than any because wives assume that they need more prayer than, <laughs> than anybody. Uh, this keys for our government. This is a book on helping open the altars to your church called Praying Grace, where on Sunday morning you could have people trained and say, our altars are open this morning. Would you like to come here and receive prayer this morning? and let grace touch people as we pray for them. Um, but this, uh, let me just overview this presence-based church. I, I touched on that a moment ago. This is a stained glass window. How many of you have ever been to Jasper, Alabama? Take it off your list. Uh, but this is a stained glass window at First Methodist, Jasper, Alabama. It's a stained glass of Martha in the kitchen 
and Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Uh, very interesting uh, glass. And, uh, and basically what I do is I teach that there is a Martha church and a Mary church. Uh, for example, the Martha church uh, believes in God, but the center of the Martha church is people. How many do we have coming? Who do we have coming? And how can we get God to help them? Uh, God is our helper, and we want God to come and help these people. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. The Martha Church is a great church. Uh, actually, I'm a recovering Martha pastor. <laughs> uh, but if, if all your focus is people, you really get in trouble because if all you want to do is help people, tend to people, sometimes people will take over the church. Uh, the other church I call is the Mary Church, which is, is more Christocentric. It's uh, focused around bringing people into Jesus rather than just seeking God to help people. We want them to become like him. The goal of the church is to become like Jesus as much as possible. Uh, I won't go into these, but this is what I call consumer-based church, a church for the people, by the people. Whereas the presence-based church, kind of hard to define, but it's a church that seeks more of God's presence. That when the staff meets on Wednesday or Monday, they ask themselves, did people experience more of his presence today or yesterday at, at church? Uh, defined by his presence, uh, experiencing his presence, uh, the difference that his presence makes. Uh, the the people-based church is more into programs, now, there's prayer there, but it's mostly in the crises. Uh, what does God need to do for you today? Uh, there's competition because it's about numbers. This church lives in the book of numbers. By the way, Martha's last name is Stuart. <laughs> and this gives you an idea of the kind of church this is. Very precise, very on purpose, very... I say perfect in every way, um, which is not bad. I'm not knocking the Martha Church, but I'm simply saying for, my, for us, it's not just about people. It has to be about God. Uh, the question is not how do we get more people to come, but how do we get more of God in this church? Uh, this church grows by sheep shifting. Uh, the church down the street does something that the people don't like, so they'll shift to your church. And then you'll do something they don't like, and they'll shift to another church. The problem is sheep shifting does not really make the church grow. Uh, Jesus did not say, go into the world and shift the sheep. Now, if you're an angry pastor, don't say that real fast, because you'll say the wrong thing. Uh, but it's really, because one, one of my passions is one of the things I did before I came here to this conference is I went on to the church snapshot page in your website and I looked at all the churches in this conference and, and one of the columns that really did get my attention was the professions of faith columns where people, how many people profess faith for the first time here in our church this year? And folks, church after church, it was zero. Church after church, it was zero. And for some churches, the last 10 years, now I know some of your churches are small. Uh, I know about small churches. My first church had 20, my second one 12, and my third one had eight. So I know about small churches. But the fact is that we, we must be uncomfortable with a church that has no professions of faith. We want people to publicly come for the first time and profess faith in Christ. You can join from First Baptist or First Presbyterian, that's fine, but we want professions of faith. And, and the problem is that across the board, across our denomination, 50%, 60% of our churches do not have one profession of faith every year. I don't know, that seems to be a concern for me. I hope it is for you, because if we were McDonald's and we had that kind of selling record, we wouldn't be in business very long. We sold no hamburgers. <laughs> what makes sense? Uh, pastor Fetch, come here, Pastor. We need you. And this pastor basically 
is for the people and does everything to keep them happy. He wears a pager and a phone, maybe has two phones. Uh, his day off, they take him, they get her, or whatever. But Pastor Fetch, I noticed the other day I went into Home Depot and I walked over to the little counter where you fill out applications for being hired. And the first question it had on there was, where did you pastor and how long you were there? Because some pastors get tired of being Pastor Fetch. They love the Lord, they love the, but they just get tired of being uh, a fetch to all the people. They throw their bones and they run after them. And so they go to work at Home Depot instead. They'd rather work in the plumbing department. Uh, the problem, <clears throat> I won't go into all these, is that in the Old Testament, there were Moabites, Hittites, and Parasites. <laughs> now they're controlites. Because when you cater to people and give in to people and may try to make them happy, suddenly they take over the church. And the church becomes theirs. <clears throat> and they start trying to control where the money is spent. They try to control what the preacher's doing. And sometimes the board meetings are a conflicted area where people uh, didn't get their way and they want their way. Whereas in the presence based church, it's not a matter of my way, it's a matter of Yahweh. That we want God to get his way. And so there's certain things there Levitical worship, first love, prayer, compassion. Presence evangelism means that we invite God to go first and touch them, and then we tell them about Jesus. Um, I do a whole workshop on this, about eight hours, so I'm not going to be able to get into this, except I wanted you to see that it is dangerous when the people's agenda takes over the church, and we do not consider this question, Father, what is your agenda with regard to prayer? Everybody say that. Father, what is your agenda with regard to prayer? We, we know that sometimes, if, I know in Houston, if we pray hard enough, the Texans might win. But that takes a miracle. Uh, we know that he'll help you find your keys. We know that he'll help you find your parking place by the front door of the mall. But the problem with praying what we want is sometimes if we don't get it, we become mad at God. And this consumer agenda with regard to prayer really turns us against prayer because we didn't get that job. We didn't get that raise. We didn't get that advancement. And God let us down because she didn't get healed or he didn't get helped. Uh, so we have to balance that. And I know God helps us find our keys. He, he's glad to do that. But to balance that, we say, Lord, what is your agenda? For example, how can we pray for the Great Commission to be accomplished so that we have professions of faith? So it's not just zero in the column, but there's one, two, three, and it's a growing number of people who come to the church and confess faith in Jesus for the first time. Uh, I remember one day I was, we took our family for vacation, sitting, and we went to a park, and early in the morning he woke me up and I went and sat on a park bench and he told me this. He says, if you'll pray for the lost, I'll give them to you. I said, fine. That's all he said. Well, I went back to my church and I realized I didn't know any lost people. All I knew was Christians because I was a pastor. The only people I knew who came to church and I took care of them. I was their shepherd. I visited them in a hospital. And, and so it began to challenge me to, to ask myself, who are people out there who don't have a church? that need us to pray for them to be saved, to come to Christ, that the Holy Spirit will work on them. Uh, I remember that week going to Hazelhurst, Mississippi. You ever been there? Take it off your list. <laughs> and I met a lady named Rachel Bass. And as I was talking to Rachel, um, this, this list fell out of her Bible. Uh, I kept it in my Bible. It's the only thing in my Bible. It's tattered because it's been in my Bible for 30 years. But it's the most wanted list. And I looked at it, and there was 10 men, and I figured she was single. <laughs> she said, oh, no, a man's the last thing in the world I want. But she says, every night I get on my knees, and I pray for these people to come to Christ. I don't want to go to heaven without them. 
Boy, I was smitten because my most wanted list was a black gold wing or for the Cowboys to win something. Uh, so it challenged me to make my most wanted list. Uh, first of all, it was a piece of paper where I just wrote down the names of my sisters and some of the people in my family who I wanted to go to heaven. Not all of them, but some of them. <laughs> you know how that is. Uh, my children, and I then began to look for names, like the guy who manages the car wash and uh, the girl who works at the local cafe. And so I began to pray for them. And what happened, within three months, everybody in my list got saved except for one, and that was Fidel Castro. He may have gotten saved, but I have no relationship with him, so I didn't know if he did or not. But this praying for the lost began to create in me God's heart for people who are not here, who are outside of Christ, that need to come to Jesus. Uh, on the back side of that card, there's a number of scriptures to pray for them, for God to give us a burden for lost people, to claim laborers for the harvest. And by the way, this prayer card is on the uh, conference thing that you go to to get handouts. I don't know what it's called, but just... If you don't have anything to do, take two or four or five days or a week and look for it. Uh, but we help people to think about ways to pray for the lost, claiming scriptures for the lost. Uh, and so this is on the back side of that card. Now later, we, we wrote a book called The Most Wanted Devotional. And uh, there's a a place in it where you can write the names of people. And what, what we like about this is that we get everybody in the church to get one of these. And for 40 days of Lent, or 40 days up till Pentecost, we pray for these people by name to come to Christ. And uh, there's a prayer, there's 40 prayers based on uh, scripture promises with regard to salvation. And then on the right side, there are examples of people who have come to Christ. Uh, because I asked people, I said, now, how did you come to Christ? Here was Chuck. He was desperate. TV was blaring because he loaded his 357, drank a bottle of Jack Daniels. He wanted to die. One final expression of anger, he hurled a TV remote at the wall. The channel switched to a preacher preaching. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Not to SpongeBob, but to a preacher preaching. And uh, he so fell on his knees, accepted Christ, forgiveness, uh, and then he received Jesus, and now he's a minister in the South Alabama Conference. I think if God did that once, he can do it again. Hallelujah. Uh, so just encouraging people that there are people you can pray for, that the Holy Spirit will work on and woo them and draw them to Christ. And that should be what we call our most wanted list. But again, it's not just getting what I want. Is saying, Father, what do you want? And then praying prayers like, Lord, give me this high school for you. Lord, give me this junior high for you. I circle this high school wanting it for you, Father. Because I think if any of us saw the biceps of God, we would pray bigger prayers. If we saw his biceps, we would pray bigger prayers <laughs> to complement his greatness. Uh, so even now, I might just ask you, who do you know that... that that might be on the outside that we need to pray that the Holy Spirit will work on and bring to Christ. Um, so one of the first things we did was to try to begin to pray God's agenda. Uh, now the, the second thing regarding this desire for professions of faith is praying for your pastor to become an evangelist. Timothy Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. John Wesley said this, you have nothing to do but save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. And go not only to those who need you, but to those who need you the most. He says, I don't care how many times you preach or what you do church-wise, but to save as many souls as you can, to bring many sinners as possible as you can to repentance is the goal of what it means to be a Methodist pastor. And so as, if you're a pastor here today, 
it might encourage you to say to your people, would you pray for me so that we can have more professions of faith in this church, that, that I will be a magnet to sinners, and that I will attract people who are unchurched, and that our church, uh, that God will bring an effective to me, that I will baptize more often people outside of Christ. Now, I did that, and it began to work. Uh, I gave a little table card, which is on my book table, which is over there outside those doors, that says, have you prayed for your pastor today? On the inside of that card, I will give them my evangelistic goals, that I want to baptize at least one person this month. And we started doing that, and I said, I want to baptize two people every month. Would you pray for me to be an effective evangelist? And would you pray for our church to be a receptive haven, harbor, that people will, will, will come because the Holy Spirit draws them? Who will say, you know, I've driven by this church hundreds of times, but for some reason today I saw your sign and I pulled in here. Because the Holy Spirit quickened them and the Holy Spirit caused that attention to be given to him. Uh, then I want, to, I want 12 confirmands this year. I know that somewhere in an apartment unit or trailer park or somewhere, there are kids running around that I could uh, begin to have contact with and put them in confirmation and somehow baptize those kids to come to Christ. That some way, somehow, God would bless my preaching that when I preached, people would be smitten and say, how can I have this Savior in my life? One of the things that, that happened for me is my people prayed for me and God gave me a gift for funeral homes. <laughs> what I did is I stopped and I started giving my cards to funeral homes in Houston. I say, now call me if you have a family who doesn't have a pastor. Well, I do one funeral a week. I speak to 100 to 200 people who are outside of the church. They don't own Bibles. Sometimes the music is Led Zeppelin or uh, Willie Nelson. It's not church music, but I get to go in there and I tell them about Jesus and the hope of eternal life. I don't say anything about their loved one because I don't know their loved one. But I just simply say, Jesus is alive, and if you'll open your heart today, he'll come into you to comfort you and be with you and be your God. That'll preach at a funeral. And suddenly, on Sunday morning, you could say, now how many of you people came here today because of a funeral? And hands will go up all over the room. Pastors, if you want to reach people, go to the funeral home. I know you think you're in one, but you're not. Go. <laughs> that was a terrible pun. Take that off the tape. That was terrible. I'm so sorry I said that. The reason I said that was I was in a Methodist church one Sunday, three years. So. Two weeks ago, I buried a young man, 23 years old, who, who, who drowned on his vomit because he drank too much alcohol. At the funeral were 800 teenagers. We threw our church open to them. And then we had cookies and coffee for them, the family and the other adults. Many of them came up to me and they said, why are you doing this? We're not members of this church. Why did you throw your church open to us? And this is what we tell them. The church does not exist for the sake of its members. It exists for the sake of its non-members. The church exists for the sake of its non-members. That should be a good point. You should applaud that or something. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you, the church does not exist for you. You're already there. You have your boarding pass. It exists for the community, for the people in your community that Jesus says, I came to seek and to save the lost. Uh, so we just got this gift. It may be, I don't know, the funeral. I'm not telling you to go to the funeral home. I'm just telling you, Holy Spirit, where can I find lost people that I could share Jesus with, that I would be attracted to them and them to me? Uh, for, for us, it became the funeral home. I mean, it's not my favorite thing. I really don't like funeral homes. And... I sat in that little back room, and I was fixing to walk out to 200 people that I don't even know, to bury somebody I don't even know, and it's very uncomfortable. 
And I always asked the father, I said, Father, what do you want me to tell those people? I don't know anybody in that chapel. He says this, tell them, I love them. Tell them, I love them. And when I walk in there and I say whatever I say, I come to the conclusion, I say, I want you all to know that God loves you so much. He's not mad at you. He wants you to come home. It gets so quiet in there. It's almost like a holy hush comes over them that God is speaking to them about his love for them and his desire for them to come to him. So guess basically what I'm saying is this. If, if the lost people don't come to us, we got to go to them. We can't wait any longer. If we wait any longer, there won't be any church left. <laughs> We've got to change that column from zero to one or two or three or four or just somebody coming to Christ and professing faith in him. Uh, my, as I told you, my beginning in Methodism wasn't very good. My first church had 20. My church, second church had 12. And my third church had eight. In the point of system, I wasn't going up very fast. <laughs> And little I realized the church that had 12 on Sunday, uh, the DS says, you're the last pastor. We're going to close the church. So I'm basically sending you there to close the church. I remember walking in that church and kneeling at the altar and saying, Lord, I don't want this church to close. I want this church to grow. I want every Methodist church to grow. Your church can grow. And, and so I said, Lord, what can we do? And he said, well, if they don't come to you, you got to go to them. I said, well, where are they? All the Christians are in the Baptist church. He said, that's not my point. I don't want you to win Baptists. He said, look across the railroad track. And there was a beer joint named Jim's Place, a beer, a beer joint called Jim's Place. He said, I want you to go to the beer joint. Well, <laughs> I was uncomfortable with that. But I went ahead and went Saturday night, parked my little Volkswagen outside, went inside, sat down at the bar and ordered a Coke. Everybody got real quiet because they knew I was the preacher boy in town. But then they start coming over and talking to me. And they would say things like, you're the preacher, aren't you? Uh-huh. He said, can you smoke and go to heaven? I said, sure. You just smell like you went to hell and back. <laughs> you know what happened, though? I found out they had names. I found out they had needs. And I found out they had creeds. A name, a need, and a creed. And if I could meet the need, the creed would change. Usually the, the creed was something like this. God's mad at me because I drink and I, I'm mean to my wife and I'm angry and I have outbursts of rage. God could never love someone like me. But as we came into relationship and began to pray for them, the power of God could change that need to meet that need so that his creed would change to the fact that by grace am I saved. Listen, all of us need to remember this. You here with, are you with me? You didn't eat too much. You're not sleeping, are you? That uh, God spreads grace like an eight-year-old does peanut butter. God will spread grace like an eight-year-old does peanut butter. Everywhere. For whoever will come. Well, suddenly this, I must say, as a young minister, it really impressed me. And so even today, I began to realize that if they don't come to us, we got to go to them. And some of the ways he's helped me understand this is, for example, uh, oh, by the way, I wanted to show you this. This is a picture of John Wesley's prayer room. Right off his bedroom, there's this little prayer room. And at 4 o'clock every morning, John Wesley was on that kneeler praying. That's the birth of Methodism right there on that kneeler. And when you go there, I asked the tour guide, I said, can I kneel on that? She said, sure. I cannot tell you what it was like kneeling where John Wesley knelt at 4 o'clock every morning. So I don't know what the man had. I know what the man did. Would you just let some of that mantle fall on me? Well, as a result of that, uh, we began to open our altars and people began to come. You see, the altar is where we do business for the kingdom of God. And just to say, we want to open the altar so that we can do kingdom business. 
If you've had a hard week and if you're mad at Donald Trump and you saw a bad scene and something bad has happened, come to the altar and let us pray with you. Because when people are touched by the compassion of Jesus, they're never the same again. His compassion is the greatest advertisement the church has. And so, um, well, I, I don't have time to go into all these. Altar ministry is not uh, practical things as you listen at the altar. Don't talk about yourself. The main number four, use breath mints. You know, you ever watch on TV those people that fall down when they're prayed for? That's bad breath. <laughs> uh, but what it is is this. Uh, I don't want to get into that either. I don't have time. But it's the compassion of Jesus released at the point of contact for a felt need. When I put my hand to God and one hand to them, then suddenly his compassion flows through me to them. It's ordinary people praying for ordinary people that become conduits of grace. You're conduits of God's grace. Look at the closest person to you and say, you're a good-looking piece of wire. You're a good-looking piece of wire because that's all we are. I didn't mean for you all to hug and kiss and everything. I'm just trying to... <laughs> but uh, we want people to experience... You see, in the consumer-based people, people experience good coffee. We call it Jehovah Java and donuts and people, and it's wonderful. But what we want is for people to experience God, because if they experience God, they'll never be the same again. If they experience me, they're going to leave the same. If they experience just you, they're going to leave the same. We want them to sit there and the power of God, the Spirit of God, the presence of God to come on them to touch them. And it gives God an opportunity to do more in one second than we can a lifetime of counseling and preaching and trying. Uh, it's a display of public prayer. People look up and say, oh, they're using the altar again, which gives them permission to go public with prayer. It's, uh, I said that. Um, it maximizes ministry and the manifest presence in the context of corporate worship. It's an opportunity for people to respond to the gospel for salvation, for healing, for freedom, and fulfillment, for fullness. And it's an act that glorifies God as God, as needs are met, and people experience Jesus personally. And so my challenge for us is that what can we do more to open the altar to invite people there to be prayed for, that they could experience his grace? And having experienced his grace, this is what praying grace is. It's praying God's nature in the light of their need based on the righteousness of Christ, asking according to Scripture and having confidence that God will hear us and that Jesus will be exalted in this answer to prayer. I know I didn't go into detail on a lot of this because I want you to go buy the book. I don't want to take those books back with me. If you have any money, I'll give you the book. <laughs> I'm not interested. Although the proceeds go to hungry children, Mine. Uh, one other thing we found that was effective in praying for sinners and becoming friends of sinners. To become a friend of a sinner. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Was to go to their home, stand on the porch and pray, and then hang a door hanger on the door that would say, a prayer protection for your home. Homes are at risk today. Through the internet, and through movies, through all kinds of stuff, the homes are being deluged by terrible things, violence and immorality. And, and so our homes are at risk. And so to be able to go to a home of somebody we don't know just in this neighborhood and say, we're praying for the protection of your home. You can't read it, but on the right side, the prayer is this. Lord, you're majestic and sovereign. Cover this home with your presence that so no evil will enter. Mark this home with your name so that sickness and sadness will pass over and around. Set angels on the four corners of this house so that no harm will come here. 
fulfill your promises for this family, for this home, and grant them the well-being that only you can grant. And we ask this in Jesus' name, who is alive and who is able. I don't know about you, but if my home is being threatened, if my home is under jeopardy, and I come home and some Christian from some church has hung a prayer of protection for my home, it makes me have good feelings toward that church. That maybe they're not thinking they're better than me. Maybe they're not judging me. They came by to offer prayer protection for my home. Or this one, may God bless your home. So, now this is what I call aerobic evangelism. There are a lot of Methodists that need to lose weight. We just gotta get out of the church and walk the neighborhood to lose weight. No, well it wouldn't hurt. But many of us think the church is a hotel, but it's really a go tell. I think if Jesus came back today and the church was a, a football team, he would penalize us for huddling too much. They were under house arrest. Somehow, what could we do to get people out of the church, onto a street, to walk around and pray and maybe stand on a porch and stand on this porch and say, I bless this home in the name of my God. Now, on the, the right side of the prayer is what we call the ironic blessing, which is in number six, where it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine up on you. The Lord, turn his countenance towards you and give you a tranquil mind. He says in number six, put my name on the people. And so just to hang this blessing begins to say to them, maybe the church is not mad at me. They're willing to come by and bless my home. I don't even give money to that church. Here's one. If you have prayer in your need and you want somebody to pray for you, hang that cross in the window and we'll stop by and pray for you. Now, I know that's pretty radical, and maybe only the zealots in your church will do that. And if you don't have any zealots, just pray for one at least who'll be willing to go into a home and just pray for them, having been trained in that praying grace. Here's one uh, question. Is there a need in your family for prayer? We believe that God answers prayer. If you'll write your need right here, and you put your church's name on all these so they'll know that you're not a cult, that you're a really reputable, wonderful First Methodist Church, and then put a stamp on it and mail it to the church. Uh, when, I was, when, when I go to the mailbox, and these are in the mailbox, I cannot tell you how they touch me. And I go into the prayer room and I lay them on the prayer station and people come by during the week and pray for these. Let me tell you something. There's always more Kleenex in the waste paper basket next to these than there is in any other waste paper basket. Because when people start praying for the needs of mankind, compassion of Jesus moves and they weep because the Father weeps over hurting humanity. The Father weeps over hurting humanity. And we identify with that pain. You say, well, I'm, I'm not much into that door hanger stuff. I don't need to lose weight. And I just don't want to do that. That's fine. You don't want to do that. Those people go to hell. Don't feel any pressure from me. Just stay the way you are. Uh, but here's another thing. Get you a prayer box. Some years ago, I was in, uh, where was I? I don't know. I took it off my list. I was in a church that had prayer boxes, and they were all over the church. And uh, and I was looking at one of them, and the, lady, and the lady was showing it to me. And as I was looking at it, the Holy Spirit said to me, this box is in the wrong place. I thought, well, maybe it needs to be down there by the office, by the pastor, or maybe it needs to be out there. And then that night, we went to dinner at our steakhouse. And as I was sitting there, this little Harley Davidson family was sitting over there eating. They're all dressed in leather. She was 20. He was 70. About five kids. And as I was praying our lunch, I blessed our, our chicken fried steaks, and I looked up, and she was staring right at me as though she had been fasting and I was eating chocolate. Almost as though she was saying, is what you just did work? And then I realized that the prayer box needs to be in the steakhouse, in the liquor store in a waiting room, in a place where people go, especially in a dental office. These really go good in a dental office. 
You, you ever got billed for a root canal? Just praying for somehow you to pay this root canal bill. Um, and so, now here's a box. This is a box that uh, is on some mailboxes in a trailer park. There's about 100 trailer park trailers in this park. And this box is sitting on the mailbox. Bill Smith put this box there. In one month, he won 18 people to Jesus. In one month, he had 18 professions of faith. Because when they went to the box, the mailbox, they dropped their request into this box, which is God's mailing address, which is box 316. Isn't that good? Box 316, God's address for hurting people. Isn't it something old men can think of things like that? Uh, here's, a, here's a box. This is on a payphone in a, in a jail, uh, Montgomery County Jail. The fact is we had to take the box out because it got 80 requests a week. Overwhelmed us. We just couldn't do it. But you know the secret to that box? You see that pen in the box? That's our church's pen. They always steal it. I'm not say steal it. They always borrow the church's pen. And it's what we call pen evangelism. You know, our church goes through 30,000 pens a year. It's the most hidden plan of evangelism in all the world. Just get your church pen in their hand. When they write their checks, they sign their bills, and they look at a piece of your church. Your church is in their life, and they're, they're, you, got, they got, you got some of your church in their being, <laughs> their, their home. Where, where I live, there's not hardly a bank. You can't go into a restaurant that you don't see one of our pens. <laughs> the people are signing and paying a check with it. Aren't you glad you came today to realize that if your church just had pens, it could grow with their name on it? I'm just being facetious. Um, here's a box in a gym. When, they sit on the, when they're on the treadmill and they're jogging, they see this box. Do you need prayer? And what happens is they... they of course, they take off the prayer request thing, and they fill it out, and they drop it in the box, and suddenly, this little piece of paper becomes a bridge of God's grace that flows through you to them. Because we have people then who take these and write out love letters to them. Do you know there's some people in the world who don't know anybody cares for them until they miss a payment? <laughs> That's supposed to be funny, but agree. I speak with time release humor. Maybe you'll laugh later. I don't know. But for a, a single girl who dropped this prayer request in at the daycare center, whose husband's left her, she's raising four kids, and suddenly she gets a letter from First Methodist that says, we love you. We believe God's on your side, that God wants to help you. I want you to know that God meets all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. I want you to know that his peace that passes all understanding can be yours. I want you to know that, that God protects you and will watch over you because of Psalms 91. And she gets that love letter in the mail, and she thinks, somebody does care, and I didn't miss a payment. <laughs> and you begin to make friends with sinners. And grace begins to flow through that. And so somehow, some way, we change that column from zero to at least one who made a profession of faith and came to Christ, um, which means doing spiritual warfare for souls. Uh, but God's given us authority that we can do that. Wesley says our one job in life is to save souls. No matter how much other church work we do, we must win souls. And therefore, uh, well, at any rate, I've run out of time. There's some other ideas I wanted to share with you. But let me close. In, in, in San Antonio, Texas, we have a place called the Methodist Missions Home. And it's a home that is for, for unwed mothers, and it's also home for people who are healing impaired. But in 1897, there was a huge brothel in downtown San Antonio. And uh, just 
several blocks over was Travis Park, Travis Avenue, United, Travis Avenue Methodist Church. It wasn't United then. The pastor would go over there to that brothel and would witness to the madam. And one day she accepted Christ. She said, what am I going to do now? Well, then later the girls accepted Christ. And, and they turned that place, that brothel, into a home for unwed mothers. It began to grow and began to prosper. And now today, it's the Methodist Missions Home. Isn't that something? Wow! That's our heritage. A pastor who didn't worry about his reputation, who went into a... Because Jesus says, I came to seek and to save the lost. He wasn't waiting for her to come. He went to her. Took courage, but he did. And today... I have families who get babies there. It's so neat because when you get a baby there, uh, Duramire's just got twins. And so you, we, we went over there, and they have one room on this side of the chapel and one room on that side of the chapel, and the doors open, and this family comes in, and the nurses come in carrying the baby, and they meet at the altar. And in a sacred moment, they hand the baby to the new family, our babies. Not a dry eye on the house when a couple receives a baby at the altar at the Methodist Missions home. Well, if only we could receive those babies into the kingdom of God at your altars, at your churches. Maybe we could create a holy distress, a dis, dissatisfaction in us that says, we, we just can't go with no professions of faith anymore. I don't care what it takes. We've got to change that zero to one or two, three or four, because Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. And just, Lord, put that passion in me to do that. And the Holy Spirit will birth a new creative ideas like that. Um, well, at any rate, thank you for being so patient and so... Uh, I, I think you really enjoyed this. I can't see you, but you seem like... Um, when, when, one thing good about these lights, if you got up to leave, I wouldn't know it. <laughs> I used to have a lady on my front row that used to make faces at me when I preached. And she would do like this sometimes. So I just took off my glasses. I didn't care what she did. <laughs> well, the Lord bless you. Let me just pray with you. Father, I thank you for information, but what we want is impartation. And I pray that all over this room, you would impart to us a passion to pray for the lost, a tenacity not to give up, to knowing that we have a labor of love, an indebtedness to love, not to pay you back, but to do what you did for us, for someone else. Put names, ideas, and ways in order that this conference, that every church would have a profession of faith. That somebody would come forward and say, I. I believe in Jesus, and I want to make it public. Thank you, Father. It's just need to tell you this. The story comes to mind. It was in a little country church in Texas, and there was an old man that lived across the street named Rupert Owens. And one morning, the Holy Spirit impressed on me that Rupert needed to make a profession of faith. So that morning, I went over there, and I knocked on his door, 8 o'clock, and I said, Rupert, i got to talk to you. He's a single man, older man, lived in a little old wood frame house. We went back in the kitchen, said, had a cup of coffee. I said, Rupert, you believe in Jesus? I do. Have you ever publicly made that known? No. I said, you need to do that. Because Jesus says, if you'll deny me before men, I'll deny you before God. But if you'll make known me before men, I'll make you known of you before God. Something like that. So I just left and went to church. We had our, our 11 o'clock service, and he walked in the door. At the end, I gave the invitation, and Rupert came down and made a public profession of faith in Christ. Four days later, I did his funeral. God wanted that man. God wanted that man. Such is the love of God. Such is the love of God. Well, go get them. In Jesus' name.
Amen.